is not lying to you. So if you know this person and he tells you, I just came uh, from uh, Toronto and there's a massive fire there. There's no reason for you to doubt that person if you know their trust and he's saying, I actually saw it. Now, obviously, it's the higher knowledge for you to go there and actually see it yourself. Because now you transmit that to somebody else. So-and-so told me that there's a fire in Toronto and he saw it. Now, if the person you're telling trusts you, then they'll believe it. But if they happen to know that you're somebody who's known to tell stories, right, fabricate things, then they might doubt it, even if it's true or not. So the transmission of knowledge is based on trust in Islam. And the first and foremost source of our trust is Al-Amin, is the Prophet himself. He is Al-Amin. He is the trustworthy one. He's telling us that Jannah exists. He's telling us that Jahannam exists. He's telling us that the Qur'an is a revelation. And we're trusting him. Ultimately, we are placing our trust in the Messenger of Allah. Because when you say, Amin to be dahi, it means I place my trust. Right? A amana is a trust and Iman is from Amana. And the Prophet said, La Iman in Iman, La Amana Talah. He has no Iman, the one who has no trust. So Iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a trust. In what? In Allah, first and foremost. In His messengers, in His books, in His angels. We are trusting that these things are true and that these are valid sources. That the angel is a source and a trustworthy source of knowledge. Jibreel alayhi salam. He's called uh, Shadid, right? Shadid al quwa the fierce one, right? He's a Qawlu Rasulun Kareem. He's a noble messenger. And noble people don't lie. So, when you look at the sciences, you have to recognize that we do have a, a, a basic trust in our Imam. We trust them. And now people can say, no, I only trust Allah and His Messenger. Well, th there's, that is just somebody who has not thought out the situation. Because what you know about Allah and His Messenger is what has been transmitted by trustworthy sources. In other words, if you say, I only trust what Allah and His Messenger say, how do you know what Allah and His Messenger said? Because the Qur'an has been transmitted. The Qur'an is transmitted. How do you know that that book that you have, the Qur'an, unless you took it from somebody who took it from somebody who took it from somebody and you trust all the chain of narration, you don't know that that book hasn't been, things have been replaced. This is what happened to the Christians. Right? The Christians' book has been changed and altered and yet they still trust the people uh, who print those books, that they're true. And it gets worse because now they change it arbitrarily because of political correctness. Quite literally, they just change things because that's old-fashioned. And they don't tell the people. So the person goes to the bookstore to buy a Bible. He doesn't know this is in fact a politically correct Bible. And there's been things that have been uh, taken out of that book. So we know that the Qur'an is, is absolutely sound because of the chain of transmission. The Hadith, you're trusting Al-Bukhari's research in the men that he took from. You're trusting Imam Muslim's research. You're trusting Imam Madik's research. You're trusting Ibn Wahbin's research. You're trusting then each chain of transmission. And furthermore, you're even trusting the Lebanese uh, book sellers, which is a disaster. <laughs> because they're not trustworthy, unfortunately. No offense to Lebanese people. <laughs> but they're just not anymore. They're out for money. And, and beautifully, Hadith illustrates, At-Tujjar hum al -hujjar. Merchants, they are corrupt people. And one of the Sahaba said, Kithi yakunu dariki ya Rasulullah? How could that be true when Allah has made tijara halal? And he said, because they do things like swear oaths and they know it's a lie. Just to make money. And that's not an insignificant hadith. And that is why that a true merchant, a tajir of sadiq, is with the shuhada on the yawm al qiyamah. And anybody who's had any practice of commerce will know why that hadith is true. Because it's very difficult to be absolutely 100% truthful in all of your business transactions. I guarantee you. Anybody, I mean, you tell the person, oh, that coat looks great on you. You're just lying. <laughs> You're lying, you know, to sell a garment, right? Or it's a really good bargain. And you know it's a lie because it was made for 10 cents in, in Costa Rica and you're selling it to them for $150, right? 
I mean, this is what merchants do, unless uh, they, they begin tawfiq from Allah. So, the point being is that we place trust in our sources of knowledge. Now, who do we place our trust in? Ahl al-dhikr, who are they? They're siqat that have, the ummah in each generation has said, these are the trustworthy people of this science. How do we know that they're trustworthy? Because the vast majority of our scholars have, have accepted them and they don't have ikhtidaf. There's, there's not big ikhtidaf in them. There's, in other words, if you find a scholar in which there's a lot of difference of opinion in him, it means he's, he's somebody that you have to be careful with. Somebody, I guarantee you, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, you won't find difference of opinion amongst the entire ummah of people who know uh, the science of hadith, you're not going to find difference of opinion. The, he is an imam in that science. The same is true about Imam al-Bukhari. The same is true about Imam Qad Iyab. The same is true about al-Hafiz ibn Abd al-Bar. In the science of usul, you won't find difference of opinion. Imam al-Baji is one of the great usuliyin. In the science of tafsir, Imam al-Jassas, the Hanafi scholar, is one of the great imams. Nobody's going to debate that. And therefore, we know they're rightly guided. Does that mean that everything that they tell us is true and accurate? No. There are probabilistic errors in their work. And some of the errors are clear and blatant and have been pointed out by scholars who come later. Right? So, the, the, the rightly guided works have been looked at and literally, like a sieve that they, they take over the centuries, scholars will come, they'll pick up the work, put it in their sieve, and they'll shake it. And they purify it. And so after 10 centuries, you know, you have a book like uh, the Muwatta, and you have several commentaries on it. Great minds have looked at it, they've gone through it, and they've given us, you know, the final word. So this is a basic trust that we're having. Now, with the science of, you have that with the science of Aqidah, you have that with the science of Fiqh, you have that with the science of Ihsan. You have this with all the sciences. So this is basically now just a, a sh exposition on what then is necessary for us as simple Muslims? And you know, Sidi Abdullah said, he mentioned this morning, and really, uh, it, I, it was amazing because uh, Sheikh Ibn Abi Jamra, who is a big wali of Allah, the, the book he's reading from, he was somebody amazing. And I was telling um, Sidi Anas that his, at the end of his book, I, mean, I, re I think it's just so interesting because, you know, with books, you pick up a book like this one, and on the back, it'll say, uh, we certify that this translation corresponds to the Arabic original and conforms to the practice and faith of the Orthodox Sunni community, al Azhar. Uh, there is no doubt that this translation is a valuable and important work, whether it's a textbook, Dr. Faha Jabr al-Alwani, etc. This is truly a magnificent piece of work, Dr. Farhat Ziyada. We have here an English and authoritative companion of Muslim law, Dr. John Williams, The Muslim World. So these are, this is called, in logic, this is actually logical fallacies, right? It's an appeal to authority, right? <laughs> but I mean, it's true. They're all saying true things. This is an amazing book. But this is, this, is, um, this is an appeal to authority. Now, if they really are authorities, as I said earlier, then there is credence in what they say. But generally, what booksellers will do is they'll just put uh, names on books to, to give the book some... And I've always wondered why, you know, you just don't put, like... And maybe they do, you know, just make them up. I mean, I'm sure he didn't. <laughs> but maybe they do, you know, Henry Kissinger, this, you must read this book. And, you know, what's he going to do? Sue the people or something like that. So, so the point being is that in, in Sidi Ibn Abi Jamra's book, at the end of his book, he has 70 visions of the Prophet ﷺ, either seen by him or by others, telling you to read his book. And I just think that's so amazing, that that's who's on the back of his book. The Prophet of 70 visions telling people, read this book. And in one of the visions, the Prophet ﷺ told one of the Imams, go and tell Ibn Abi Jamra that he has understood my words. And that if you want to understand my words, to look at what he says in his commentary on, on Imam al-Bukhari's book. And it's extraordinary. So that's part of a proof of the validity of the book when several people all over the Muslim world and the amazing thing about the vision is they didn't end in his life people continue to see them afterwards so this is part of I mean this just strengthens the, 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 the source if the vision is seen by a thiqah 